Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's MOLA Zoom project. My name is Solimar Salas. I'm the Vice President for Museum Content and Programming at the Museum of Latin American Art, MOLA. We welcome you today, Wednesday, January 26th of 2022, to this edition of the MOLA Zoom project in conversation with the artist John M. Valadez, where MOLA Chief Curator Gabriela Urtiaga will discuss with the artist his work and career. MOLA also acknowledges the support of the Dwight Stewart Youth Fund, the Kenneth T. and Eileen L. Norris Foundation, the Miller Foundation and the Arts Council for Long Beach for their constant support of the educational programs at the Museum of Latin American Art. In each chapter, the conversation of the artist and our MOLA chief curator places the focus on a series of specific artworks which require a close inspection and deliberate process of contemplation and exploration, delving into the ideas surrounding the creation of the works their sources of research and inspiration in an effort to immerse ourselves in the world of the artist. In chapter 17 of the Mola Zoom project, we interview renowned artist John M. Valadez, who lives and works in California, United States. John M. Valadez has been making significant artwork for over 45 years in the Southern California region. His work has come to define an iconography of Chicano experience in the city, mm -hmm. using both the changing dynamics and reconstructing a mythical allegory that speaks to a unique vision. This has been done through numerous federal and state mural commissions throughout California, Texas, and France. Mr. Valadez has a 35 year retrospective at the San Diego Museum of Contemporary Art in La Jolla in 2012 that was critically acclaimed. He was given a six week residency in Bordeaux, France in the spring of 2014 in celebration of the 50th anniversary of Los Angeles Bordeaux <laughs> Sister City Art Exchange. John was honored with the Vincent and Mary Price Legacy Award from the Vincent Price Art Museum in 2017, along with a distant Joan Mitchell Fellowship Award. Mr. Valadez was included in the traveling exhibition Building Bridges in the Time of Walls through Mexico in 2018 to 2020, and will be included in the Trader Survivor Icon La Malinche and the Conquest of Mexico, traveling through Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas in 2022-2023. With this, I'll introduce Gabriela Urtiaga, MOLA's Chief Curator, who will take over for today. Thank you so much, everyone that's here, and enjoy. Okay. Thank you, Solimar. Thank you, Solimar, for your introduction and all the MOLA team. Hola, welcome to MOLA. I hope you are well and safe, and thank you for showing us today. Hello, John. Hello. Good to see you. Quite an introduction there. I, I like oh that. My yeah, goodness. Nice. Oh, thank you so me. much for, for speaking with us today. It's sure, of course. Honor. I'm honored. I'm honored. Oh, Absolutely. my goodness, Sean. Well, uh, Sean, as a one of the most pivotal artists in the Chicano art movement, you highlight the Mexican American experience in Los Angeles starting in the 70s. And from your beginnings, you were interested, of course, in art, but also in political action, right? Yes, yes. Uh, that's you, what, um, yes. And could you tell us uh, uh, your beginnings as an artist and also your commitment with the climax of that complex uh, social and political period? Well, the, um, the crucial times were when I was about to leave high school. Uh, I grew up, I'm a native of Los Angeles. I grew up in predominantly the Boyle Heights area, right next to the, our big uh, statue called Sears and Roebuck. Mm -hmm. And I was, I, was, I was instructed from my family to go to Huntington Park High School for you know, family reasons, another value story. But around the 11th and 12th grade, uh, I started to get really self-aware of, of things through the education. In those years, the education was pretty good, even if, you know, well, anyway, education, I'm trying to edit my, myself, please. Um, I apologize, but at that time, the, um, the, the, the social political up, upheavals of the assassinations of Robert Kennedy, John Kennedy first, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and a lot of the, uh, you know, the people from, from Fred Hampton, from the Black Panthers, George, George Jackson, 
and the San Rafael group um, that um, all the prison stuff. Um, I was a reader at that time and I've always liked nonfiction. I like documentaries and I was being politicized just by what was happening. At the same time, the walkouts were happening, 68, 69. I didn't really participate in the walkouts. It did happen in our school, but not, not as big and as dynamic as uh, Roosevelt High School and Garfield and Wilson. Um, but we were affected by it. And then eventually in 1969, I went directly from high school into ELAC. And we were really involved with uh, being against the Vietnam War. I was real part of that. I was, you know, I, I, I joined a group of people. Uh, we, were a, we were a theatrical group. I was still always in my art classes uh, at ELAC. And uh, we were, I was just learning how to, well, you're learning what your voice is and what to be an artist but also this a theatrical group from, uh, from uh, East LA College, we had a nice little like, group of people and we decided to do uh, the Corky Gonzalez, Yo Soy Joaquin uh, poem. We, we made it a, a theatrical production. It's, we called it, it was basically like Gruda Theater, almost like Teatro Capesino, but very small and mm -hmm. East LA. We actually went to some festivals there and everything was in those years, I was talking between uh, 17, 18, 19, 20, we were part of the moratoriums. There was like three marches that I was part of and the sheriffs always made sure that it ended in chaos in those years. So it was a, it was a, very, it was a very hectic time. And through all that, I met some very important artists, bless their hearts, some of them have passed away and um, we were always just dis discussing. We want to be artists. We're, we're you know, Mexican-American, wanting to be Chicano. And what does that mean in art? What does that look like? Yeah. You know, what, you know, what, um, so how do we build that? And that's, that's just in the arts, in the plastic arts, and even in theater, and in, even in uh, uh, writing, Hollywood was, you know, we some a lot of us were very practical. We're not we're not going there, but some did. Uh, but I decided to stay in the arts because I've always liked the drawing and painting. And you have to develop your voice. Mm -hmm. Your voice meaning what are you what are you going to paint? And I've always liked realism. I've always was I've always liked what I see. Evidently, I had a particular kind of an eye. And I tried to develop and nurture that. And so, I, so what I'm finding from ELAC, um, I was almost going to graduate with that, with the AA, they, they call it. And I had a chance to go to uh, Long Beach, uh, California State uh, University, Long Beach, right when it became from a state college, big deal, to a university. Like, well, you know, like, oh, that sounds better. But anyway, I joined the art department, I joined Long Beach. And I, I, I always got pretty decent grades in the art department. The other departments, forget about it. I was, I barely, maybe once, once in a while, if I was interested, but again, I'll try to edit. The art department, that's where you start to develop. And people tell you that, wow, you know, every time you would get uh, crit critique, it was always positive. Most, you know, most of the time it, it was positive. And then I, and then I, I got involved I was always involved in the political and in the social uh, struggle. So eventually I, I became part of the uh, Centro de la Raza, the East Long Beach Neighborhood Center. And a lot of them were from the Metro group that took over the social, um, the social political center. And, uh, we, and a lot of us de developed an art. We always wanted to, with, with, with no money, uh, we would do this art center upstairs in this in this theater department from as part of the Centro. And it, it was the East Long Beach, like I say, East Long Beach Neighborhood Center. Now it's a Cambodian center. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I mean, so, so we were up upstairs and and I was able to have a studio 
it was my first experience in working with a, a Chicanos and one Peruvian guy. And we developed, <coughs> excuse me, a, a center. And, and every summer we would work with the youth, the, the, uh, the summer youth. And that's where I, I met, I met him earlier, but that's where I really got a very good friendship with uh, Gilbert Magoo Lujan at the time. Um, yeah. We called him Magoo. So we really, that was about the 73, 74. Yeah. And uh, so we became really good friends. And I really got for, through him. We used to go to these Chicano gatherings, which are the early 70s. We get it, we get into his van and we and we go up north, somewhere like Fresno. And I met people, other Chicanos older than me, 10, 12 years older. Uh, the Royal Chicano Air Force, Jose mm -hmm. Montoya and Esteban Villa, mm -hmm. and, and, and the other guys from there and San Francisco, Rene Yanez and Frank, I, his last name, I don't, I, I apologize. And um and you know people like that, and then and then the Fresno people, the La Brocha, and the women, the uh, mujeres muralistas, and we also yeah. at that time, um, about seventy seven, we I helped do a a mural for the for the farm workers, and the crazy guys from San Diego. I still know a lot of them. Victor Ochoa is still you know running strong some beautiful work. So I was very honored and very blessed to be part of that. Mm -hmm. And I was introduced through through Magoo. And then I met, you know, the other, um, I met Carlos Almaraz and Frank and uh, Beto. I met the, the Los Four. And mm -hmm. for a time I was, I have a joke, I was Los Four number six, okay? Cause there was like, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, right. So, you know, I was, I really got involved and I felt uh, a lot, I felt really honored, you know, and I kept doing my own work and my work was basically, it is at that time, especially after a really uh, time of searching and working through a lot of issues, personal issues, um, I started to do identity. The thing about me for being a Chicano was who are we, what do we look like? How how is our living conditions in the urban center? And I, I work was always about conflict. It was like just a position of um, conflict. And also I really tried to really uh, render things very highly. It, it uh, and I and I started to work. Um, I started from you know I uh, I hand um, court coordination but I always have so many ideas I use I started to use the camera as a sketchbook I've said this often and so I developed that that way I wasn't trying to just redo a photograph which was um hyper realism was a big deal at 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 the time I always wanted to put a story I always wanted to yeah. put myself in there a voice yeah and Sean of course you you are a, a, a muralist a painter a photographer and as you mentioned you participate in the Chicano Art Collective including Los Four with Frank Carlos Judith and Centro de Arte in the right, 70s yes. and 80s and you are a curious artist I remember when I visit your studio you have a lot of of fields, music, uh, and oh, yeah. you have a researcher, right? That work with humor, but, but also with a um, realistic view, the different decades of the community. And for that, I would like to, to watch with you a short video from 1981. Okay, yeah. There's a whole kind of diverse range of different ways of working on murals. And uh, it's nice to see that there's more than one way to do a mural. <laughs> for myself, the reason why I use uh, photo projection is for the effect. It's having that same effect, the same impact as like a TV screen or like films. In order to get people's uh, attention, you have to attempt to match whatever the media that we're very used to uh, looking at. 
mostly it's the feeling and uh, making either things like this, such traditional kind of universal icons, or like the other portrait. Hopefully when it's done, it'll, it'll be very passionate and very much concerned with the problems of assimilation for the youth and for, and for just people just kind of growing up within this country. The Latino population in this city is second only to Mexico City. That includes all of Central and South America. So to me, that's pretty significant. What I'm doing, along with other people in the Chicano art movement, is to counter the negative media image of ourselves, Latinos, trying to do it in artwork. And the way that I found to do it is to just simply paint ourselves, draw ourselves, all the facets of ourselves. And for me, that's my biggest enjoyment in the work that I do, is to paint us on the street, the people that we know, because it's, you know, there's a sense of identity there. There's a sense of this kind of uh, ringing bells in people's heads, which is nice, that we are OK. <laughs> Wow, well, <laughs> that was interesting to see. Wow, don't that get old, huh? Experience, right? Well, and so you saw briefly uh, Richard Duardo and uh, Gronk. We're all that age, that very thirties. Um, yeah, it's interesting just to, to to see that. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and those years we were developing. You know, I was developing uh, what I was doing, and I was very re revealing to how I, I do it uh, at that time. And now that's a pretty standard way of working. That's just one of the many ways of, uh, of, of uh, working. We, I started with graph. I started with, you know, um, you know high and, uh, hand, eye, and then we went to graph and we learned all the techniques, pounce pattern, especially when we would work with the youth, uh, high school youth, even, uh, even sometimes grammar school youth, uh, we would use pounce patterns out in the streets. And uh, we used every kind of technique possible. And I was still, because that was 84, I think, 1984, mm -hmm. by, by that time. That was uh, the murals of Aslan, when we were all invited. There was uh, Frank Romero, Judith Hernandez, Carlos, the streetscapers. Healy, Wayne Healy, and uh, David Boteo, and uh, Willie Heron, and Gronk, and myself. We were all invited to go into the Craft and Folk Art Museum, and, and they had a restaurant called The Egg and the Eye. It was right on Wilshire. It's still there. I mean, the Craft and Folk Art. But the restaurant's got uh, gone. Thank God. So we go in there painting with oil paint, clashing with the restaurant smells. It was very interesting. It was like, wow, what was that? Yeah. And we would work at night and people were inebriated to go to the restroom and they talked to us and they were kind of drunk and they would, they were, some people, some, some people, best, they started crying because we were Mexicans, but, but we knew how to paint, speak English really well. Like, again, I need to edit myself, but that has a lot of memories of that, mm -hmm. um, that particular time. Always yeah. having fun, and I've been always working, you know, always. Oh, but, but and real quick, the altar that I was doing on that dresser drawer, I don't know how much you can decipher what I was doing. That was uh, Louis Perez's mother's altar from her home. Uh, Louis Perez from Los Lobos. Uh -huh. So that's kind of a little side thing, you know, everybody was connected yeah. somehow. No, and I, and I really love the connection with other artists in a collaborative way. And yeah. the mural of Aslan was in 1981. And last year- Really? No, the mural of Aslan? 81? Yes, 81. Oh, I thought it was, wow. Yes, okay. 20 years. Yes, and it's amazing. Wow. I thought it was 84, 81. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. And Sean, the, the, the series of from the East Los Angeles Urban Portrait Portfolio from 1988 mm -hmm. are a shame. And all of these pieces are full of beauty and meaning, right? And could you tell us about your message in this particular portfolio? 
And what was your creative method in this case with documenting this group of young people where of course the picture becomes a social commentary of the urban life? Sure. Well, it's that's that's easy. The thing was in those years, like I say, I was working from my imagery because I never really thought that I was going to be a, like a classic photographer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I took photographs for the information and I would subvert the imagery, I think, like I would put five or seven, sometimes 12 images together, especially as I developed it between five, four, five, seven, 12 images together to make it look like one, one space. Um, it, 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 so some of the best work became, it looked almost cinematic because they would be a seamless, I would use all that I learned um, in terms of, you know, scale mm -hmm. and uh, light and color to make, to make pieces look like they all belong together. But as I was out in the street, sometimes I'm painting a mural. Like for instance, this particular image on the screen was from my daughter's quinceanera. This mm -hmm. family, the, the girl, her mother, when, when, uh, when I would go to work and my daughter's mother, she would go to work, they would take care of my daughter. She was three, four, five years old. And these people, this family, there was a few people, I forget how many were in the family. It was a large family. They were the Balams and they were from Merida. And there was a split between the, the children that were born in Merida and what their experience were, and then the ones that were born here in Los Angeles and what their experiences were. And you can almost see this division in the, in the family about the different experiences, what the struggles were a lot differently. And there was a quinceanera, and this is, uh, I forget her, I mean, I'm sorry. I forget her name, it's been so long. And this is her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And I actually photographed the whole family. I did a series of like portraits of, of the whole family. And this is one at the quinceanera and there are other ones in the set. There's a set of 12 um, that have been making the, the exhibition circuits in the last few years. And these pieces, a lot of them, I never made paintings from them. There's a few, uh, there's a few images, a few photographs. I never made uh, other paintings or anything from them because they pretty much stand alone on their own as a photograph. There, there wasn't a lot of them as compared to all the literally thousands of imagery that I would photograph. But there was but there was always some, I don't know, less than 20, 50, I don't know. I haven't gone back through the imagery uh, for a, a few years, all of my stuff that, that really stand alone as basically East LA portraitures of, of the youth of the time, like I would stop, we would be painting murals on Brooklyn and Soto. I see people walking by or waiting for the bus uh, in various ages. And I would ask their permission if I could, if I could photograph them. And I would give them example, I'd show them examples of stuff that I do. And more times than not, they would let me, they would give me the permission um, to photo. This is basically, in the mid 77, 78, when I got decent cameras into the 80s, into the early 80s. Um, so that's a series, that's where these came, uh, these came from. Just to show people, I've, I've always been conscious that the, the, uh, the, the dominant culture and the dominant classes you know, really read a lot of baggage into when they see uh, Rasa, where they see African Americans and even Asian uh, people. I mean, even to this day. So I was really conscious of that, and I and I, and I was always trying to, I was always trying to humanize us. I mean, just just to show who we are, 
like um, the guy on the left, he came, this is my studio. This was at the Public Art Center. He, he, he came to my studio because I photographed his girlfriend out in the streets. This is in Highland Park, for instance. And he just came and he wanted me to photograph him. And then he wanted me to, to photograph him and his girlfriend together. That, that never happened. And the one on, well, let's see, that, that is my left. The mm -hmm. one on my right, is um, these, these two guys that were coming down. This is basically Soto Street towards which what is now Chavez. It was Brooklyn Avenue. And right across the street from the, from the 76 station is, it was a mural that we were working on. This is about 78, maybe a little, yes, it's, it's, I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, and so anyway, they were, uh, mariachi uh, musicians. And the reason why I know this and the reason why I know about the community, <coughs> excuse me, and me photographing the, the community and who these people were yeah. is as part of that, uh, that retrospective show or, or the survey show from La Jolla, it ended up at East, East, Easter Day College. And one of the girls, a, a, a young woman who was going, was a student there comes to the show and said one of these guys I forget which one that she said was that that was her grandfather and I thought wow and like it's like these are real people in this you know these this is this this is the community and people see their own you know family yeah. in a museum and again that's for me that's kind of like I mean you have a vague notion when you're working that I'm I'm, I'm showing us, yeah. and again it was a, it it was identity, and this whole thing about a very I have a strong I, I had a very strong feeling towards empathy for ourselves. What do we look like? And that's why I wanted to be a highly realistic technique and style to really get to us a presence mm -hmm. instead of uh, I mean even though. You know, I shouldn't say instead of, but I I really like you know, like realism. I really I was challenged to really bring some sense of presence to these people in my work. That was one of the challenges, and and then then it eventually evolved into allegory and irony and you know the theatrics and the humor, hopefully. But it started with straight representation and putting them in a gallery. And uh, basically, you know, daring people to take them home, you know, basically. Yeah. yeah, so. No, so beautiful, Sean. And one of your contribution as a multidisciplinary artist is that you really love to work with documentation. You imbue this into your work and flow in a very realistic expression. Yes. Uh, can you can you talk a little more about your relationship with the camera, but also using a photo projector, other tools in your creation? Uh, we can see now two vendors from 1989. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it's basically all my techniques are just on just an e a means to an end. It was uh, is to use various sources uh it wasn't just my by this time it wasn't just my my it wasn't just my photography and straight you know reproduction for instance these two guys uh with their shirts off is based on something that i saw i was on broadway uh and i had a studio on broadway in the victor clothing for 15 years and the reason why, because they, they hardly ever raised the rent. They were very good to me. I mean, they, they kept me from basically being homeless until I started to, in the late 80s, I started to uh, be a part of that second um, art movement, uh, the, the art boom, whatever that, that is. I joined a very good gallery, thanks to Gronk, uh, the uh, Saxon Lee, uh, Candice Lee and uh, Daniel Saxon. He eventually became the Daniel Saxon Gallery. I was there for 
I don't know, frick, how many, seven, eight years, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. And I was doing these pastels. This is like a, over a life size. And these two guys, they're basically from, when I used to walk the streets of Broadway uh, with my camera so I could stop painting, I would see photo no novellas mm -hmm. and from Mexico City. And I was always interested in, in my earlier, before all this, when I was still in, still in uh, college, like uh, Mexican crime magazines. They were fascinating uh, to me to see that sense of reality. Because in those years, that was the only thing that, that we saw in terms of Lat Latinos besides, you know, like Anthony Quinn, Ricardo Montalban, mm -hmm. you know, uh, people from that era, R Rita Moreno, in those movies, any, anything else was uh, the Frito Lay, the, you know, the, all the stereotypes that we were, you know, trying to make it a better imagery of ourselves. But I saw a lot of that uh, photo no, novella stuff. And, uh, and so these two characters, these two guys were from photo no, novellas. And mm -hmm. I put them in this, I put them in this realistic setting and the sense of the heads, I don't really explain the whole thing because I want you to, I want you to tell me what you think that I'm doing, which is always a lot more interesting than, you know, what, um, what I was doing. For it, it's hard for me to, to, it's hard for me to articulate this, but this piece is a classic example of a writer. I have these images that I saw these two guys, not these two specifically. It was a very hot summer day in LA, smoggy, hot on the street, in front of all these merchant stores and all this color and all this, all this consumerism, buy this and take it home to, to your kids and the rugs and the trash and all this. All this for me had some meaning to it. So I saw these guys cross each other in the street and look and look at each other like I thought I was the only guy showing my muscles or whatever, you know, in the street. And I thought it was funny the way they so I kept that in my head. And um, as I was doing work, I thought, you know, I need to repro I need to recreate this. And so that's and this is how my work eventually evolved into uh, this kind. And it was a lot more fun, a lot more challenging. And I was using pastel, which is basically a painting technique without the oil, without the water, without the spirits, without the, the medium. It's just pure chalk. Then I was inspired, I was inspired by uh, sharing studios with Carlos Amaras. And I saw his pastel work. And I was inspired by what he was doing. So I wanted, I wanted to use it in my own work. Um, a lot of the pastel work. Oh, I I love this 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 pastel, uh, Sean. And and I would like to talk about your relationship with the city of Long Beach. <laughs> oh yeah, right. <laughs> because yeah. I know you have a pretty special relationship with the city, a very close friendship with this place. And in fact, I would like to tell when visitors get to the city of Long Beach, coming from LA one of the first things they will see will be your mural on Broadway Street in downtown Long Beach, like a wonderful welcome to the people in the city, right? Yeah, it's, I was, again, I was very, very fortunate. It's right on uh, Broadway and Magnolia. When you take that last um, off-ramp off to the left yeah. uh, and you go right into the city, Instead of going along Shoreline Drive, it's the last one, and it's where it's where Broadway has uh, developed. And yeah, and the, so the mural because I went, like I say, I went to, I went to school there. I almost lived there, but my uh, but my wife now of thirty some years, she says we're not going to live in Long Beach. Forget it. We're not going to, you know. I want I wanted to actually live there, but I love the weather. There's some beautiful you know spaces there. But she said, no, 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 no. So, but uh, this mural was re is really challenging. It was really, it was really fun uh, to do. 
It has a, a aluminum cutouts where the pelican's up on top and the spruce goes way up on top there in the orange skies. And I have a UFO and the ocean, which I love to paint the ocean. And it's, it's basically, it's called Welcome. To, so you can see the shadow uh, behind the woman in the light pink uh, Catalina bathing suit. Those are shadows of the pelicans ab above. And to do a horizontal composition, I was really uh, pleased by how it developed and how it came out. And I used that one iconic hotel that's been there forever. Didn't put in too much of the development because this is a, a nostalgic piece for me because we used to go to the Pike in Long Beach with my mother. She'd take my brother and I on, on the red line. It was that, it was the um, sort of a train, like, I guess, from LA to Long Beach because she never drove. So we would take that and go to Long, Long Beach to, uh, to see the Pike and all those images when I was, I was, I was pretty small. So this is for a, a real, it was, it was a nostalgic piece and I'm very proud of it because it, it still stands. I, a friend of mine photographed it a couple of days ago actually, and it still looks as vibrant as it did when we did it. You know, when we, you know, when, when we, when you, when you use it, the right paint, it, everything works out well. Okay. Yes. Look yeah. fabulous. And it was a long process, right? Yeah, well, it took a year. And I mean, I work because I have a year uh, deadline. There's there's a lot of details about it, about where I was. I, I didn't have to pay rent uh, because it was a part it was a part city project and this development there are condominiums uh, here. Uh, and right across the street is the fire department. The other side of the street is the state. I guess the Long Beach, it's the state courthouse. And that was being being built at that time. So things have really developed after all these years. And thanks for reminding me about uh, Bordeaux was 2014. I think this was before that. Mm -hmm. The years run, you know, they come by. I don't know. There's, yeah. I mean, did I do this after or before? Don't get old, you know. 2011. This one? Yes. Oh, okay, yes. So it, it was before. A, a, a couple of years be before that then yeah it was fun it was it was it was very enjoyable um yeah. to work on this it was very big yes very and sean I, I know that southern california especially the beach are very inspiring for you oh um, yeah are central in your creative process where you mix the realistic painting as a documentary street climax right as as a result, you make and create cinematic moments in your painting. That's the idea. You know, after seeing all these all these words and all these conclusions that I have, it, it's it's from doing the work mm -hmm. and realizing what I'm doing later, how to how to explain it and how to label it after I do it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's like. I mean, I'm really driven. Like the ideas are much more dominant than the articulation. The articulation comes later. Like, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> and I go, oh, I see. Yeah. And I see. So it becomes my vocabulary. It becomes um, what I'm trying. And sometimes it's a much more harsh and sometimes it's much more celebratory because a lot of things are already a drag i mean every some things are already like man you know um and i only i only work on that if i have a very clear idea about what i'm trying to express either positively or to challenge the negativity uh, that i see not just in los angeles uh it's in the southern california area and also in the world, you know, this, you know, what I'm seeing and how I can address it yeah. um, and create challenges for myself. Yes, and we can put the focus in the Convertible Beach Opera from 2014. Right. And tell us what is the symbol and representation 
uh, of the beach in this painting and murals. And the other question that I would like to know is, what is your relationship with the viewer when you are working in a public space? Oh, well, God, you know, I haven't, to be honest with you, I haven't worked in the public arena for many, many years. Um, and, and when I did, it's very challenging because you have to focus on your work, the work you're doing, but people are, are coming by and they're asking questions and they're looking at, at, at the work. And I tend to want to work um, in the evening. I want to work when I want, if there's too much distraction, it doesn't come out the way that um, I would have, I would, I would have, I have very, I have, I have very high standards about what I want to put out there. Sometimes even that gets in the way. Uh, I should be a little bit more expressive in terms of the brushwork. Once in a while, I, I, I do that. But most of the time I have a story and I want to put that story out. This particular, oh, so anyway, so the, so the murals that I did after a, after a time, I did some murals, like the, the murals out in the streets, uh, citywide mural projects and other, uh, um, other commissions that I got, all those murals are gone. Mm -hmm. None of them, none of mine anyway, and not just mine, but I worked with the other artists at the time. They're all gone. Graffiti, earthquake, the yeah. streetscapers painted over our mural, but I didn't, you know, I didn't get upset about it because I painted over Frank Romero's mural. And then at St. Corner, uh, Soto and Chavez, where the streetscapers mural is now, is where the mural that we did with Glenna Boltach, Barbara Carrasco, Carlos Callejo, mm -hmm. and Roosevelt High School. There's probably a few more and I apologize. Uh, we did a mural there and we covered Frank, R R Frank Romero's spray can mural that he did. His was in, I don't know, 60, I don't know. I don't know, his, his was older and it was fading and he, it was a spray can mural. Mm -hmm. So we covered his and that was a public thing that we did. And there, it was good to interact with people and some gang members would drive by calling the gang name out, seeing if we, we, we react. So Vario Politics was involved. And uh, it was always different. You know, it was like, anyway, I, don't, I, I have to edit, but there's a lot of stories there. Yeah. Okay. Wow, and so, and so, yeah. And, and so after a while, um, it, be, it became a, a, a a, a, a technique that we would paint the mural in a studio. I, I did a federal mural project, which is 15 by 70 feet long. I did it in a, in a Santa Fe mm -hmm. uh, railroad warehouse, 15 to you know, 16 foot ceilings. So I could so I could work constantly and not be distracted. That was a two and a half year painting. It's it's in the federal courthouse. In Santa Ana, there's another um, uh, mural that's that's in the state building on uh, Broadway and Hill on Fourth Street. There's a there's a state building and in, in the auditorium, there's a mural there, and there's another one. Oh, in El Paso, there's a mural. This mural you're you're looking at was it was from 2014, and I was asked if you, if you can imagine to 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 go to Bordeaux, France and work in this museum, which is the equivalency of the Los Angeles County Natural History Museum. This is Bordeaux's natural, I mean, yeah, Natural History Museum. France's, you know, history goes back over a thousand years. And they have this, they have this an amazing uh, collection. And I was, I was invited to go and work on a mural for them during the sister city thing there that was uh, uh, Los Angeles and Bordeaux because Bordeaux is uh, it's like it's 30 miles just like like how Los Angeles is 30 miles away from Long Beach mm -hmm. Bordeaux is 30 miles away from their at Atlantic Ocean so mm -hmm. at the similar weather and uh, but you know it's France you know and yeah. and also 
the ethnic makeup is very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but the black um, people are mostly from Africa, which is different. And the Latino people are mostly from Spain or they're gypsies. Mm -hmm. And the Arabs is, is, is prominent. And there's, a, and there's a lot of universities. So it's kind of a, it is an old city, but it's got a young vibrancy to it. So be able to be there, and it was during the, the World Cup. And so, I mean, I was just, I mean, I worked. Uh, this painting I did uh, using two assistants from France. One was uh, this, this, this beautiful woman of uh, Florence Henry. And then the guy, this guy, uh, he's, a, he's a big Cheech Marin fan, uh, Laurent Bastide. And he would try to imitate uh, Cheech with a heavy French accent, which was hilarious. <laughs> uh, I mean, just to hear him talk and stuff. So we had a really good time. We painted this in five weeks. I don't know what this, because this is in metrics. I think I, I estimated 14 by 26 feet, but it was in, it was in uh, meters. Mm. It's in three. It's in three different, three different sections. You can barely see the the lines, and it was, and it became much more of a, of a, of a political piece than I realized. And I put stuff in the, um, in the, in the clouds. It's kind of a, a semi riot. There's a skull you can see or you can't see. I used uh, what's his name the the photographer's piece. Um, Cunningham, he's a photographer. And mm -hmm. the central image is pretty much his image in the uh, in the French version of, of the Volkswagen, the mm -hmm. douche, they call it. Uh, I don't know. It's, and then I used, you know, some of the low riders. The one uh, on my right is a homage to Magoo and his yellow low riders. And then and then and then the one on, on my left is a is a Chevy and the people are in it. Because at a certain point in my visual language, I started using, because of Los Angeles road rage, I started using um, the cars as a, as a staging because people are in their cars and they react to each other, you know, with, you know, different urban slights and sometimes it gets violent and sometimes it's just theatrics yelling at each other because we're protecting our own little supposed space and the convertible is a perfect thing where we can I can stand them up and do this interchange and I really tried to get away with the idea that the guys from the pink car are throwing a power drink to the other people that are trying to get in the car whatever that whatever that drama is but in fact they told me no no John come on that's a Molotov cocktail <laughs> that's not a power drink you know because mm -hmm. I tried to, you know, say, wow, but I thought it was, you know, it's orange. No, John. Orange. So, yeah. So, yeah, it was fun. And and also, if you look on my left, way up in the top corner, I put another UFO, mm -hmm. which is, if I have a chance, I do that because it's a very, it's a very LA thing to do. And on the top right, there, you can barely see a woman in the clouds. A very, it's based on this Renaissance painting. I don't, I don't remember who the actor, I mean, who the painter was mm -hmm. and this guy, you know, like looking at her, that's the Filou, which is the, you know, he's like the peeping Tom, you know? So, mm -hmm. uh, so this was, a, this, again, this is really, I'm, I'm trying to get this painting here uh, in town to, to maybe show it, but it's just a dream. You gotta find the funding and the, ex, and the exhibition space, which I'm, I'm, I'm working on. But anyway, it's basically showing it could be a California, maybe Big Sur area, but it's France. Yeah. Wow. Fabulous. And you know, Sean, time flies, and we have a lot of more uh, pictures to share with our audience. Oh, yeah. Sorry, but see, we, I talked too no, much. No, no, it's, it's really beautiful to hear you. <laughs> but uh, before to open the Q&A session, because oh, we yeah. love to talk directly with you, Okay. Uh, I would like to put the focus in another important project with this particular series where you create amazing collage pages and a new reinterpretation of this group of photonovelas magazine with a new title, a new context of the final piece, 
with figures of the pre-Columbian and contemporary images like Tango Muerte or Las Luchas Lumbres. We would like to know a little more about these compositions. Okay, I'll try to be concise. I'm trying <laughs> to do um, like relationships and also history, uh, Mexican Chicano his, his, history through these periodicals that I've been um, collecting for many years. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so I try to use them as the backgrounds and I try to max the ink and the color to put a statement in front of them. And for me, it's to, it's, it's to reflect on our visual history. And that's as simple as I could, uh, and then I'm as, as simple as I can say, it's, excuse me, sorry about that. No All right. worries. Yeah, so that's basically as simple as I can say it. I'm using the imagery, uh, the, the background, like Dia de Mexico, photo novellas. I'm going to start using the crime ma magazines, but I'm developing the ideas about those. So this is this is my latest, um, you know, work uh, that I've been doing, and I really I really enjoy it. Yeah. And again, I realized I'm I'm using like I tell you this is the third time. I was like, wait a minute, I'm using our history, and I'm using stuff that they don't print these anymore. You know, they don't print the photo novellas they got from the comic books into television. You know, and I thought, wait a minute, that's right. It's they don't print these any, anymore. This was like the 70s, 80s. So I feel really good uh, doing this. It's really a lot of fun. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I just, this is what I want to do, so. Oh, yes. No, they are fabulous and look amazing, uh, Sean. And uh, well, uh, if you like, we we can open the Q&A session. Yes. Yes. And Jorge is the curatorial assistant and he can read the question from our audience. Okay. Hi, John. Uh, really quickly, I just wanted to tell you, the, the histories are just pouring through you. And it's just an immense honor to have heard all of that. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And I will open the Q&A session. Uh, Alma says, hi, John, I'm getting into photography and was wondering what camera you used for your portraits in the 70s. Do you have any tips to achieve the look your photos have? Thank you. Well, you have to, yeah, uh, the thing you have to do is get a decent camera. Back in those days, we would have to do a self-focus and, and I have glasses, so a lot of it was fuzzy, but now you have automatic, digital, and you just have to develop your, your eye. For a long time, I had, I was a horrible. I don't. I just shot anything. I just, and after a while, you start to, it fits, and you have to be quick. Um, the, I took a photo class. I was at uh, at Cal State Long Beach. There, I took photo one. I should have taken photo two, but I just again, I just want to use the camera as a tool. It was my sketchbook. Okay, uh, and sometimes I would just use something. My my poor daughter had to put on these uh, GI boots because I needed boots. I wasn't photographing her, I was photographing the information. But other time you out and you shoot what you want, shoot your vocabulary and be patient. And think about digital, um, which is different because I'm old. We had, we would buy 35, you know, 35 shots per film. I lucky if I got three, two out of it that I liked. Okay, so just don't give up. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Anna says, um, thank you for this conversation and for sharing your experience and process. Your strong influence is evident in many of our current generation of Chicano and Latino artists. How do you see this generation of artists continuing your legacy? And what do you see that they are doing differently in terms of content and form? Well, um, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question. I mean, we all face the same cultural social subject matters. And a lot of people, people, people are doing some great work. I mean, I don't even compete any anymore. It's like, let them have it. You know, like all the, you know, all the, all the residencies and all the awards and all the shows. I'm doing just fine, okay? And um, we all deal with the same issues and just do it yourself. Like when I was doing drawings of the youth 
people are still doing youth or you know oriented um is like you know like uh, that's a culture and the way the car show stuff i did a whole car show series um i i i love the ocean and that and the dynamics of the beauty of the ocean and then how we act up in, in and in front of the ocean us as uh, uh, humans the human drama is a circus and yet the earth is beautiful and those are juxtaposed and 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 the urban ideas in terms of even the graffiti we were doing murals to cover graffiti now graffiti are the murals which i think is beautiful that's called developing and getting older like i'm, I'm really glad that i'm 70 because i can do what i'm doing now and people are doing some really beautiful work and i and i encourage it and go at it Absolutely, thank you. Um, Luis asks, in, in 1986, you made a statement in the Imagine Chicano Poetry Journal about Chicano artists who are entering the gallery system, about them being bickered and criticized by other artists. Uh, do you recall a, a moment in which artists reconciled with the idea of Chicano art getting into museums and galleries? Yeah, that's a big conversation. It's, and it's not just the other artists, it was the professors in some of these universities who would call us, who chose to dare put our work on gallery walls. Because remember, we were budding communists back in the day. You know, we were like revolutionaries. But you got to make a, you know, you got to make a living. And some of us chose to um, face the gallery system, face capitalism, put our work where we come from on the walls and dare people to buy them. Whereas the professors were in these, you know, there was in these in these colleges, and they were calling us names because we were selling out our culture, and yet they were they were the ones in in the uni university getting a state paycheck from various governors, sabbatical, health plan, you know, all the privileges, which is cool, but they were jumping on us, and they were telling people that. The only thing that Chicano artists should do is go into, unless, unless you're going to get my job as a, as a professor, good luck with that. If you can't do that, go work in the communities, which a lot of us did. Uh, we worked in the communities, worked in the prisons, and we would make enough money to pay our rent and to eat and to buy art, art supplies, but we wanted to show our, our work. We, we, we wanted to establish ourselves I dare you to even look at this stuff, much less take it home. And they never interviewed us uh, about what we were doing. They would just name call us. And then I would get students coming to me, you know, Mr. Valdez, um, my teacher called you a sellout. What do you think about that? Like, wow, what the hell's that, you know? So we would have to defend ourselves and try to have them go back to, their pro to the professor and say, you know, I, I hope you have a nice uh, vacation. You know, and if you get sick, God bless that you, you know, you're getting uh, you're getting enough medical attention. So the hypocrisy is everywhere. At least ours was street, and we were just, I think they're jealous because we were having fun, what we were what we were doing. You know, the syllabus wasn't as important as uh, as to uh, work on the ideas. Thank you, thank you. Um was I that emotional then? <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you john um those are all the questions from the q a so oh, thank cool. you everyone for those are good ones questions. those yeah. are good questions yeah they cover a lot of issues i like that yeah, yeah. uh and with that i'll pass it back to gabriela i thank, thank you, you jorge and thank you sean for your, your generosity for yeah thank your you time and for sharing with us your knowledge and your experience is is a real honor okay thank you we, we could have went two hours but it's okay you know <laughs> we will continue you know, <laughs> yeah okay we can prepare another zoom project soon. okay great great no yes. it, was, it, was, it was fun it was fun yes thank you thank you Sean. Okay, thank and you. i hope to see you soon yes of course and okay yes and thank you all uh, for joining us today yeah, Hope thank you. See you in our next Zoom project with the artist and activist Eugenia Vargas Pereira from Chile. Oh, great. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. Okay, Sean, see you soon. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye, bye, -bye. everyone. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay.